Hello, I'm Kim Eagle for ACC.org from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we're covering the really important trials at the ESC meeting, which is being held in Amsterdam. Today's trials, we're talking about the August 27th, Sunday edition, uh, and we're going to talk about four trials that we think are important for your knowledge. I'm really delighted to be joined by three experts in clinical trials. We have Pyle Crowley with us from Denver, Colorado, uh, Gabrielle Steg from Paris, France, and Darren Kambani, who is from uh, Dallas, Texas. Let's start with a trial which has a wonderful name called Attribute CM. Take us away, Gabriel. Yeah, this is a, a trial that investigates a new therapy for uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy, uh, which is called acoramidis. And it is somewhat similar to tasamidis that has previously been tested and I guess approved now for treatment of these patients. Uh, it's a double blind placebo controlled trial, and it's looking at uh, this patient population, which is elderly, fairly sick, that has uh, ATGR cardiomyopathy. Um, Another interesting feature of this trial is that they use a composite outcome that is a hierarchical outcome of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular hospitalization, but also biomarkers and functional response, a six-minute walking distance. And they did the analysis using a technique called the win ratio, which is one statistical technique to try to have a comparison of the hierarchy of outcomes rather than a composite of first events outcomes. It's supposed to be more potent, provide more power, provide a more comprehensive analysis and traditional statistical methods. What the authors found is that there was consistent benefit of this trial compared to of this treatment compared to placebo in the primary composite outcome and the win ratio was an overwhelming win. But there were also consistent treatment effects and benefits across the various types of outcomes. There was better preservation of functional capacity as measured by six minute walking distance, quality of life as measured by Kansas City questionnaire. It was reduced increase in biomarkers such as nt pro B and PLU, and there was a reduced in the need for cardiovascular hospitalization. So that's really encouraging. And the safety profile of this treatment it seems to be excellent. So it's probably one more um, tool in our armamentarium for this very sick and very severe patient population. I think that's really encouraging. Yes, thank you. I, I agree with your analysis completely. And clearly with, with agents now in the field for this unique group of patient population, you wonder how long we're going to be able to do placebo-controlled trials uh, because the, the, tr the drugs that are available now clearly have benefit. Uh, and it's nice to have another one. Uh, we need competition in the marketplace to drive down the costs, which are substantial, of course. Uh, and we'll, we'll just continue to watch this field evolve uh, in hopefully a very positive way. There's another trial today called Mully Stars that caught my attention. Kyle, tell us about that. In our STEMI patients who have multivessel disease, we know that complete revascularization improves their outcomes. And that means the culprit lesion as well as the non-culprit lesion when those are found on angiography. But the question of the timing of when to revascularize that non-culprit lesion, should it happen during that index hospitalization or should it happen in a stage fashion is still a bit of a question mark for us from a clinical perspective. So this trial took over 800 patients with hemodynamically stable parameters who had had an ST elevation MI and randomized them to actually get their revascularization at the time of their index procedure or in a stage fashion, you know, a few weeks after, uh, about three weeks to six weeks after that procedure. And what they looked at was whether it was non-inferior for them to get a revascularized during the index hospitalization. And they did find indeed that immediate PCI was non-inferior to staged PCI. Now, keep in mind, there was a little bit of crossover. So this was analyzed in an attention to treat fashion. There was a tiny bit of crossover, about 2.9%. And the patients who had staged PCI, a few of them actually went on to have unplanned revascularizations prior to that staged PCI procedure. So to me, this provides me some clinical confidence that I think I can tell the interventionalist that, you know, you'll have fewer arterial punctures, you'll have fewer procedures, and it probably is reasonable and safe to go ahead and fix the non-culprit lesion at the time of that index procedure. And from a pathophysiologic perspective, it actually kind of makes sense because, you know, you improve coronary blood flow in those non-culprit lesion beds, and perhaps the effect of inflammation from the culprit lesion 
could cause that non-culprit lesion to rupture and cause those unplanned procedures and what have you. One comment I'll make about this trial, because it's very difficult if you end up doing both procedures at the same time to have the effect of the periprocedural MIs captured quite as well, because you know you get that biomarker elevation in your troponin from the STEMI. So how are you going to know when you fix the non-culprit lesion, whether that led to more damage or more elevation in those biomarkers. So the authors did a sensitivity analysis where they excluded these type four events, the periprocedural uh, MIs, and they still had the same sort of results. So that to me, again, reassures me that you're not necessarily causing more events. You're not causing myocardial damage during their ACS event. And you may get more bang for your buck because it's fewer arterial punctures and fewer procedures. Yeah, I was thinking about this product. You know, when we studied coronary physiology in acute MIs, sometimes when you go in and really look at the plaque, there's there's more than one plaque disturbance, right? There are other vessels that seem to have already been uh, disturbed by whatever process led to the demi. And that may be one mechanism where this particular strategy works. Well, we, we have to be careful with renal function, of course. Uh, and if if we reach a certain dye load, we probably need to back off and, and take a more staged approach. There's another trial here called Illumin-4 that I thought was interesting. Gabrielle, tell us about that trial. In the CAS lab, we have a, a whole gamut of intravascular imaging tools that are available to us. And one of them is optical coherence tomography, OCT, that provides exquisite imaging of the inner layer of the vessel. It's, it provides beautiful images. It has its enthusiast, but really we didn't have that much evidence that guiding intervention with PCI using OCT was associated with improved clinical outcomes or procedural outcomes uh, in patients um, undergoing PCI. And this trial is a fairly large trial, 2,500 patients across 18 countries who were randomized in a single-blinded manner to OCT-guided intervention or angiography-guided intervention. Now, the primary outcome was the um, size, the lumen, uh, lumen size uh, interest stent. So do you get a better procedural result? And the answer is yes, you get a better procedural result. The second question is, does this translate into a better clinical outcome measured by the two-year rate of target vessel failure? And the answer is no. The composite of cardiac deaths, MI, or ischemia driven target vessel reconstruction was no different between the two arms. And I think this teaches us a lesson that we, again, we need to test what we use as tools daily rather than rely on our opinion or uh, how likable these devices are. These are costly interventions. They take time. They cost money. They may be dangerous. So we need to have evidence before we use them routinely. And this is useful evidence in that respect. Yeah, I think you're... you're um spot on. Better pictures don't always mean better outcomes. Jerem, did you have a thought about this trial? Yeah, no, thank you. I, I agree. I think Gabriel's summary was exactly spot on. I think it was very helpful. And I think important uh, for the investigators to do this trial. You know, intravascular imaging has become a very important component of PCIs and, you know, increasingly encourages this sort of standard of care. And, you know, we've historically used intravascular ultrasound or IBIS and, and OCT fairly interchangeably and there is now good evidence with uh, with IBIS suggesting that it is better than angiography guided PCI. So we had the ultimate trial, for example, where there was a clear reduction in clinical endpoints uh, at one year and then sustained at three years with the use of IBIS compared with angiography. And then just today we saw the results of the opt IBIS trial comparing OCT to IBIS, where uh, OCT was non inferior to IBIS for uh, clinical endpoints. So I think. You know, the propagator transitivity doesn't seem to apply here because IBIS is appears to be better than angiography. They're both non-inferior OCT and IBIS. But in this trial, OCT is not uh, superior to angiography guided PCI. So I think from that perspective, this is an important study. Um, and whether this is this relates to sort of different patient populations or, you know, how operators, at the end of the day, operators still have to process the information, you know, that they're getting from there. The device can only uh, get you the information you still have to use intelligence, not artificial intelligence for that. So I think uh, yeah. that's kind of... Yeah, it, it, it just calls to mind that we, we, we need to personalize care. Uh, and each of these trials gives us a snapshot of uh, kind of the way forward. Uh, and this was an important trial for sure. The last one I wanted to go over today was called ARREST. 
Um, Pyle, tell us about that clinical trial. You know, what I really liked about this trial, Kim, was the fact that it was an implementation science trial with hard outcomes. So this really asked the question of whether delivery to a cardiac arrest center after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in patients who had return of circulation but didn't have ST elevations um, versus just sending them to the closest emergency room, so to speak, would have any difference in terms of outcomes. And it was a randomized controlled trial. And again, we've talked about this before, very hard to do randomized trials in this particular space, but such an important clinical question because when it comes to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, you know, the morbidity and mortality is very high and the science is very limited. And what this found was that there were no differences in all-cause mortality if you were shipped off to a cardiac arrest center that had, you know, all these resources and everything was more equipped at managing cardiac arrests as opposed to coming to the closest emergency room once you're, you're, you had return of spontaneous circulation and no ST elevations. Now, interestingly, the transit time was higher if you were going to that tertiary care center, which is not a surprise. You were also more likely to have a cath and more likely to go to the intensive care unit which in a way almost makes us question what we do because we're doing more procedures at these tertiary care centers, but it doesn't seem to necessarily be translating into any significant differences in a mortality outcome, at least. Now, I was struck by the fact that the 30-day mortality for both groups, you know, the randomized groups was 63%. So even in patients in whom we, you know, got return of spontaneous circulation and they made it to the hospital, there's still a lot of work to be done because that mortality number continues to remain so high. Yeah, it's so frustrating, isn't it? We, If you don't get them in those first few minutes, the deed is done. And we spend so much energy and resources trying to recover, but um, we're, we're still way, way, way away from, from being able to do that. A very important trial, I think it was published today in The Lancet, are coming out tomorrow in the Lancet. And um, I really commend the investigators. These are very hard trials to do. I want to thank uh, all three of you for great, great commentary on three important, the four important trials today. This is Kim Eagle for the ACC.org, and I'm out. <laughs>